Tonight, it's my great pleasure to welcome to campus Ellen Wool, who is a fluvial geomorphologist, and I'll let her tell you what that means, uh, a fluvial ge geomorphologist at Colorado State University. Her research focuses on the natural and human-influenced dynamics of rivers and river systems. She's a tremendously active researcher and writer with, at last count, 150 uh, refereed publications and journals. She's also, though, a model of a scientist devoted to conveying good, deep ecological science to a broader community through her writing. For example, her book, Disconnected Rivers, that's one of my favorites, investigates the ways that we have separated ourselves from rivers, separated rivers from ecosystems, and ultimately, in many cases, separated nature from rivers. She writes that we all live among rivers. They are the sinews that bind our landscape together. But modern people tend to take rivers for granted. They tend to not respect them as much as we should, and we definitely don't understand them as well as we should. Ellen has traveled the world, and she shares her lessons that she's learned about, about rivers and their connection to the global ecosystem through her book, A World of Rivers. Through portraits of 10 world rivers, she conveys the unique environments and landscapes of each, but also links them to each other and to us. She's also, though, taken on this idea of the global in the local and written also on a much smaller, more intimate scale, books like Island of Grass that focuses on a 240-acre prairie preserve in Fort Collins, Colorado, which is where she lives and works. The grassland that she studies in that book is an island of original prairie in a sea of modern development, but also an echo of a former landscape that used to be, in her words, a sea of grass. And in a bit of a fan moment last night, I, I told Ellen, I've read all your books. Yeah, it turns out I haven't, um, because she has, in fact, written so many of them and on such a wide range of topics and issues uh, about the relationships between water and the earth. She's written on mountain rivers, on the dangers of inland flooding, on the desertification of deltas and rainforests, and on the roles of rivers in the American prairie, just to name a handful of the subjects that she's tackled. Our first speaker challenged us to move beyond the evidence of our eyes alone. The technical sciences remind us of the value of this all the time, but they also remind us to question our assumptions about um, what we actually see when we look at nature. Um, Ellen's work reminds us to push past our aesthetic assumptions about what good rivers look like. Clear rivers are rarely healthy ones. This series has been pushing all of us to complicate our questions, to seek out complicated, messy, and difficult answers, and to find the um, new questions that puzzles pose. Rivers may seem permanent, but they constantly shift and change. Controlled, paved, dammed, and drained rivers may seem more civilized, but they're also less vigorous, less dynamic. And um, for this reason, I think that it's very important that Ellen's gonna be joining us tonight to show us quite simply that, that messy rivers are healthy rivers. So, thank you, Ellen. Well, thank you for that very gracious introduction. Can, can you hear me well enough with the lavalier? And I have to say, this is the first time I've ever been introduced by someone named Ellen. <laughs> so I'll start with just a photo. Um, it's a very messy river. This is a river in the old growth forest in Rocky Mountain National Park near where I live. And it's terrible to work in because it's really hard to get around in. And most people looking at that would say, well, I don't know, yeah, we need some work. We need to clean it up, make it a little bit more attractive. But what I'm going to go through in this talk is the reason that I think that's actually a very healthy ecosystem and some of the evidence that we've been looking at to understand how rivers function as ecosystems rather than 
simply as conveyances for water or water and sediment to move downstream. So I'll start with, a, this is the inside cover of a book that was published, as you can see there, just about a decade ago. And the author is a British riparian ecologist, so someone who looks at plants in river zones. And you know, that's a, everybody would agree, that's a very unhealthy looking river. And the emphasis was on water quality in this book, and um, I can't resist since I'm here in Ohio. I grew up in the Cleveland area, so I'm very aware of polluted rivers and, of course, the Cuyahoga history. So that's a, a pretty bad looking river. This was the opposing cover in the textbook, and when I saw it, I was really struck by the fact that I wouldn't describe that as a healthy river. It's certainly very strong contrast to what you see over here, but if you start looking at that for a minute, there's a very narrow fringe of what looks like fairly natural vegetation. Then it looks like it's more like a lawn back here. This is England, which historically was entirely forested, and there's just a couple of trees sort of scattered around. The river is sinuous, but it's all the same width. There's no wood in that channel. So you start thinking a little bit about what we expect to see with a healthy river, or what constitutes a healthy river, and how do our perceptions of that vary depending on our experience and our background, and it becomes a, a more interesting question as to what constitutes river health. So I'm going to start, and this is not just because I'm hosted by an environmental historian, but start with the, the very important context that we as people come into this question with, whether we're scientists or uh, people in the humanities or whatever our background, the human perceptions of a given place and time, so a given society, a given point in history, are very important, but also the physical context of where you are in the world and what the rivers look like there. So I'll start with a, a human construct. This is something that's borrowed from ecology and specifically from marine fisheries. And the ecologists refer to it as the shifting baseline. And it's the idea that whatever you are used to is normal. They were using it in the context of marine fisheries because they were pointing out that as fishery stocks decline through time, so you have fewer fish and smaller fish typically, fishermen become used to that. That's the norm and that's what they're used to. They don't think about the fact that 30 years ago, 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago, there were more of these fish and they were larger. That's one of the ways we've sort of fished down the food chain from the top predators, of the really big game fish, down to progressively smaller species. So the same thing applies to any natural environment. If you grew up in an agricultural area where the tree cover, if you're in Ohio, was removed 100 or 150 years ago, you may not be used to thinking about wood and streams, even streams that are flowing through a forest, because you're used to thinking of streams without wood. The physical context here, uh, geologists, and Ellen said I'd explain what a fluvial geomorphologist is. So fluvial geomorphologists are geologists who look at form and process in the Earth's surface as opposed to deeper in the interior of the Earth. And fluvial is just from the Latin root for river. So we look at river landscapes. So we designate things that are called process domains. If you imagine a drainage basin and you can partition it into discrete portions that are influenced by different processes. And this is particularly important where I live in a mountainous region because the headwaters are influenced by snowmelt runoff that creates the peak flows, things like avalanches, landslides. As you go lower down in the river basin, you get into a more of a rainfall dominated flow. And the topographic relief or the elevation difference in the landscape declines. You're in a lower relief environment, so you don't have things like landslides. So the physical processes that are bringing water and sediment into the river can change as you move downstream through a network, and that changes that geomorphic context. Disturbance regime is a phrase that ecologists use to talk about either natural or human-induced changes in the river. So a disturbance would be around here, things like a tornado, a very big uh, flood, a drought, things that can stress the biotic community and also change the physical context of the river. And then biome, of course, are you in a forested environment? Are you in grasslands? Are you in a desert, rainforest? Depending on those very different settings, you would expect differing types of physical complexity in the river or messiness. And I'm using messiness as a synonym for physical complexity. And then there's the very basic question of just what is natural? So if you're here in Ohio, what, what is, is natural before intensive agriculture, before industrialization, which is after agriculture started? Is it before people of European descent came? Is it before Native Americans came here? I 
it's not necessarily obvious what point in history or natural history, say geologic history, you want to choose as your reference point. If you're trying to understand what the rivers should look like or what they look like in the past or what you want to restore them to, you have to ask the very basic question of what's our reference framework? What are we going to consider natural? And one way that scientists approach this is to look at this either historical or natural range of variability. The key point there is that any river is not static. You know, if you went out to the Olentangy, or I never know how to pronounce it, the Scioto, Scioto, thank you. <laughs> if you went to that river and you looked at it over a period of several years, there's going to be fluctuation. There's going to be periods of flood, periods of drought. Other things might happen. Maybe a tornado goes through and there's stream, riverside trees that fall in. There's some range of variability in the channel plan form or the shape of the channel, the amount of sediment moving through, the amount of water moving through. So one of the things that scientists try to do is figure out what is that range of variability in the absence of human manipulation and then say, all right, when people come in and start altering the landscape or the river, are we moving it outside of that natural range of variability or are we still within that? And this is where land use history becomes very important. And one of the challenges is that this can involve history that we've long forgotten about. Uh, one of my colleagues, Dorothy Merritt, at Franklin and Marshall in Pennsylvania, uh, has shown that there were thousands of mill dams on many of the streams around here during the colonial era because that was a big source of power. All those dams are long since abandoned, forgotten, but the sediment that was trapped behind them when they were actively used is still influencing river form today, and we've just forgotten that those dams existed. Now, the historians probably haven't, but the people who do river restoration have. In my part of the world, there was placer mining, and it wasn't all that long ago. It was started in 1859, but most people have forgotten about that. There was massive deforestation in the Colorado Rockies. There were almost no trees left. And you look at historic photos from 1900, and it's shocking because now those landscapes are completely forested, but it's all regrown, and we tend to forget that there had been this major period of change when people of European descent first came to the area. So understanding this context and how past land uses may have moved us outside of that natural range of variability becomes very important in trying to understand what's an appropriate level of physical complexity or messiness in these rivers. I'm going to focus on headwater rivers in the Colorado Rockies, but everything I say, at least in a general sense, could apply to rivers anywhere around the world. It could apply to headwater rivers in the grasslands. It could apply to the Amazon or the Congo or the big rivers of the world. They're just different degrees and forms of it. I'm going to focus on these smaller rivers because, first of all, there's a lot of them. You know, when people think about river, the importance of rivers as ecosystems, they tend to focus on the bigger rivers, the things that you can have navigation on or you can at least float down in a canoe or an inner tube. But the little rivers are the majority of the total length of rivers in most networks. If you're just looking at the, the channels that you can jump across or you can easily wade across most of the year, that's most of the total length. They're the first point of entry for anything coming into the river network. So water, sediment, uh, good things like nutrients, bad things like contaminants, organisms coming into the river network, they, most of it comes in through that very long total length of these small rivers. So they're very closely connected to the uplands. They are very responsive. If you have a change in the water or sediment coming into the river, Usually these are small channels, they're fairly high energy, so if you change the inputs, the channel changes. By the time you get down to larger rivers, they're flowing through wide valleys, there's a lot of buffering. Water and sediment come in, some of that can be absorbed by the floodplain. The sediment can be stored in the valley bottom in the floodplain. If there's a big flood, the water goes over bank, and you reduce a lot of the energy as the water moves downstream. You don't have that buffering in the headwaters. So they're important, and they, they also don't have these extensive riverside forests because the valley bottoms are typically much narrower. So anything that changes through natural processes or through human processes is more likely to affect these rivers. They're very important in terms of diversity of habitat and the diversity of organisms, both plants and animals. There are a lot of aquatic or in-stream and riverside plants and animals that don't live in the downstream parts of big networks, but they are present in the headwaters. So they really increase the diversity of the network as a whole. And finally, at least in our country, and I think most countries, they don't have the legal protection. Things like the Clean Water Act don't apply to non-navigable streams. And this has been, the Supreme Court has been flopping back and forth on this over the last decade, saying, oh, it's up to the states, or well, maybe it's not, or maybe it is. 
uh, sort of like some of the other rulings that have been in the news lately. So right now, you, in most places, you can do anything you want to a little river because it's not considered as a river if you can't navigate it. And because of the, the total length of those, they're close linked to the uplands and to the rest of the network, that's a pretty bad idea in terms of maintaining river health. But that's the way it is right now legally. Okay, so the little rivers are important, but what makes them functional? What creates messiness or physical complexity? Different categories. One would be if you imagine going downstream along a channel. So, you know, the simplest, most uniform channel would be exactly the same width and depth. It would be just a very consistent downstream slope and would have exactly the same material in the stream beds. As you look at natural rivers, there's a lot of variability as you go downstream. The grain size varies from uh, sand or silt size material if you're in a steeper environment up to boulders. <laughs> You can have regular concentrations of sediment that create things like dunes and ripples or riffles and pools. And if you've spent any time along rivers, you're familiar with riffles and pools. In forested environments, you can have log jams that create this variability. This is a channel in the headwaters of a, a place called North St. Brain Creek in Rocky Mountain National Park. Most of this channel is much steeper and it has cobbles and boulders. But here, because that log jam is obstructing the flow, you get this backwater area, there's much finer sediment that's there. It's mostly sand and fine gravel sized material. In the absence of that log jam, that would be downstream somewhere. It would be out on the Great Plains. But it gets trapped here because there's this backwater effect in lower velocity. And there's lots of organic material. So leaf litter, pine cones, pine needles, twigs in there as well. So there's a lot of nutrients being stored. There's diverse habitat for fish. There's deeper water here, lower velocity, more fish and insects in this area. So variations in the characteristics of the stream bed are one basic source of complexity. As you move downstream, the banks can also vary. Uh, this would be something that might be more characteristic of this area. This is a, a channel in Connecticut at very low flow, but you can see the tree roots are creating this resistant portion of the bank. So there's this section of bank that projects into the channel. And then these embayments on either side that are areas of lower velocity, again, very nice habitat for fish. Or another example, this is a meadow river in southern Wyoming. You, know, you can see these irregularities in the banks. So vegetation, uh, sediment, things like the big boulders can create irregularities in the banks. But just even small indentations and, and projections in the banks create a little bit more diversity and more physical complexity. When you look at the ratio of the channel width to the channel depth, that's referred to as cross-sectional form, and this is an aerial view of a channel in Panama, there's a riffle section here, so that's my that blue thing floating in the middle of the slide. It's supposed to be the, the cross-sectional geometry of this river. It's fairly wide and shallow. You go a short distance downstream, there's a <laughs> bedrock outcrop on one bank that's very resistant, so there's the current is scouring the bed, and you have a very deep, narrow cross-section. And as you go downstream in this river, that cross-sectional geometry changes on a very regular basis. So you have these bed forms of pools and riffles. If you have bends in the channel, if you have differences between bedrock or big boulders and finer sediment, those create differences. These are all sources of irregularities or complexity. And then finally, if you look at a river in a map or in an aerial view, the shape is referred to as the plan form. So in this case, it's both the, the main channel and the adjacent valley bottom or floodplain. Is it a straight channel or do you have this sinuosity where you've got uh, <laughs> The outside of bends with faster current, the inside of bends with slower velocity, and then a variety of channels. There's side channels here or cutoff channels that are forming ponds on the floodplain. And if you look across that floodplain, there's standing water in ponds and lakes. There's, uh, and I've been on the ground there, so I know this, there's things like sedges and grassy meadows. There's spruce forest of different ages. There's a lot of physical complexity associated with the fact that this river has moved back and forth through time and has this sinuous plan form. So you can contrast that with something that would just be very straight and uniform and isn't moving back and forth much. A smaller version of this, this is a very large log jam on a channel in Rocky Mountain National Park and the yellow arrows are indicating what I couldn't capture in the photo. That log jam creates a big backwater. There's this finer sediment that ponds up behind it. Really deep water here with a lot of fish. And as the flow goes through that log jam, it splits into a series of smaller channels that branch for a while before they rejoin. So again, this complexity of the plan form. 
So there's all these different sources of complexity. The bed can vary, the banks can vary, the cross-sectional shape, and the way that the channel moves back and forth across the floodplain. So what? Okay, so what does it mean, implications of the physical complexity? One that I've said already, if you have these diverse environments going downstream in a channel, diversity of what's on the channel bed, what's in the banks, how the channel moves back and forth across the floodplain, that means there's more diverse habitat for plants and animals. If you have <coughs> diversity of habitat, you typically have diversity of species and ages of organisms. And one of the things ecologists really emphasize as being important is that biodiversity. So as an example, this is a, an underwater view. This is a, a log jam on the left here, and the current is flowing to the left. And this is one of those channels that's mostly cobble and boulder, very steep, white water, high transport. But behind this obstruction, there's all of this fine sediment that's accumulated. And there's a lot of diversity associated with sort of the small scale, the twigs and the leaves and the organic matter that's packed into that log jam. There's nice overhead cover for fish. So there's a, a different suite of everything from microbes and bacteria to aquatic insects and fish in this part of the channel, this one pool behind a log jam, than there are in other sections of the channel. And another example of that, I just have a little handheld Olympus. It's, it's the standard little digital camera. It's waterproof, so I can stick it in the channel, and uh, my head's not under there, so I'm just aiming it and hoping for the best. And I was very pleased when I did that and caught somebody in action. Uh, fish really like these backwater pools. So that diversity associated with the wood creates this habitat diversity and biodiversity. Second basic implication, why, why do ecologists emphasize biodiversity? Well, one of the, the reasons is that if you have a variety of organisms, some of them are going to be more able to survive any natural disturbance or any human disturbance. So if there's a flood or a drought or somebody spills something toxic out of a point source for pollution, some organisms, some varieties of microbes, bacteria, insects, fish, plants, the, the whole suite, are going to be able to withstand that disturbance and recolonize the site. And you have a little bit more insurance, is one way to think of it, if you've got greater biodiversity. So if you have physical complexity, you also have more insurance in terms of the diversity of habitats in the network. And these are terms that ecologists use as well as you know, we use them in other contexts too. So sensitivity in this context means if there's a disturbance, let's say a flood in the channel, does it respond to that? Does it change? Or is it really resistant and the flood just passes through and not much changes? A sensitive environment, there's change. Resilience, okay, if it changes, how quickly does it recover? You may have heard on the news last September in Colorado, we had these really impressive floods. There was a lot of channel change. A resilient river would return to the pre-flood state more quickly than a non-resilient one. So one of the things that physical complexity does is limit the sensitivity to disturbance and increase the resilience. So how quickly the channels respond. So as an example of this, this is what's called a beaver meadow. It's a place where there are lots of beaver dams and each of those dams is just like a log jam. It creates an area of ponded water. When higher discharge occurs in the river, that water is more likely to go over the channel banks and across the floodplain. So you end up with a very wet valley bottom. As you can see here, there's lots of areas of ponded water. There's many channels that branch and rejoin. It, it's kind of a watery maze down there and, and difficult to get around. But that's a very resilient part of the landscape. When that big flood occurred last September, I went up to here two weeks after the flood, once they, they reopened the first road that would allow you to access the national park. And I stood on the road at literally at the downstream end of this beaver meadow and I couldn't tell there'd been a flood. And there was massive damage downstream in places where you didn't have this broad valley bottom with dense willow thickets and this buffering zone of the floodplain. So by creating this very wet landscape with dense riparian vegetation, the beavers and the beaver dams had created this buffer to the flood. The flood came into there, the water spread out, it lost a lot of energy moving slowly through these dense willow thickets. It didn't have as much energy to erode the banks or the bed, for example, as it did in, in other areas that were affected by that rainfall. And I can contrast that with a same, the similar type of valley bottom where the beavers are gone. Once the beavers go away, the dams fall into disrepair. And instead of having water spreading across the valley bottom and being in multiple channels and in lakes and, and wetlands, 
if the water concentrated in a single channel, there's more energy in that channel when you have high flows. So it's more likely to erode the bed and the banks. The channel becomes larger. You don't have the overbank flow anymore, and the whole water table drops. It becomes a much drier valley bottom. And this is a place called Moraine Park, also in Rocky Mountain National Park. About 30 years ago, it looked very similar to that last photo I showed you, but the beavers have disappeared from this area, and the whole valley bottom has dried out. And in 2012, there was an illegal campfire at a place called Fern Lake that was just upstream from here, and it was in October, so the time when we don't normally worry about wildfires in Colorado. But the campfire got out of control, it started a fire, and it completely burned the riparian area here, which, when it had more physical complexity associated with the beaver dams, would have been that very wet valley bottom, and I'm sure wouldn't have burned in this fire. So you lost some of the resilience to disturbances, in this case, like fire and flood, by losing that physical complexity as the beaver dams disappeared. A third implication, uh, if you have physical complexity, if you think of fluxes, so water, sediment, anything else that's moving downstream, if you've got a really uniform channel, think of an irrigation ditch, things just keep going and they go fast. If you have even small scale irregularities, so an embayment in the bank, a little bit of a bump in the bed, let alone something like a beaver dam or a log jam, you're slowing that flux. The water and sediment and everything going with them, like nutrients and contaminants, are moving downstream more slowly. They're being stored for different periods of time. This is a small channel in Rocky Mountain National Park. It's got the log jam here. There's that little backwater. That jam may only last five or six years, which is nothing on a, a geological time scale or even a historical time scale. But during that period while it's there, it's going to trap and store some of that material that's moving downstream. And if that material is fine-grained organic matter, so pine needles, pine cones, <laughs> twigs. If they keep going downstream fast, and I'm a microbe or a bacteria or an insect in there, it's like, oh, the banquet's going by, I can't get it. If you can store that material even for a few minutes in association with some of this physical complexity, then the stream biota can start to ingest it and process it. And in a small forested river, that's the base of the food web. There's not a lot of sunlight that gets to these rivers, so it's, it's not so much that it's algae and photosynthesis that starts the food web, it's the dead plant parts that fall in from the riparian forest. So being able to trap and store that material is very important to provide a base for the food web that eventually goes up to the things that everybody, I guess, would be the charismatic megafauna of these streams, the trout, you know, the things that people are most interested in and want to catch and eat. So if you have this retention, whether it's a matter of minutes or longer time scales, you can slow down the passage of all these materials, make them more biologically available. You can also disperse the material that's in transport, like sediment and organic matter, across the valley bottom, store it in the floodplain. And if it's something nasty that you don't want to move downstream fast, you can dilute it and maybe store some of it for periods of time in the floodplain. And I keep talking about organic matter, the pine needles and leaves and twigs and things, and you're thinking, okay, well, the insects and the fish eventually eat that, but does it matter to us if we're not fishermen? It does. If you have carbon in the drinking water, it doesn't hurt you at all, but it doesn't smell very good, and dissolved organic carbon can <coughs> create a, a different uh, tint to the water. So it's very common in water treatment plants to remove that, and you do that by adding chlorine. But chlorine combines with dissolved organic carbon to produce a byproduct that the group is called trihalomethanes, and they're carcinogens. So you don't want that in your drinking water. You don't want to have to treat the organic carbon or some of the other things that are harmless, but they make the water taste or smell funny. So if you can store it in the headwaters by having this natural complexity, there's some very important implications for water quality downstream. And the part of the world that I live in, all of our water comes from the mountains. They're our big water tank. It's the snowmelt that supplies us with drinking water throughout the year. So if we can sequester carbon, nitrogen, some of the other nutrients in the headwaters, it's much better and ultimately cheaper for us in terms of water quality. Another one, connectivity, something that ecologists in particular put a lot of emphasis on. As you might guess from the name connectivity, it's just how readily can things move between different components in a river system. So different degrees of connectivity. The first one here, that's an um, intimidating looking word, but it's just the water in the shallow subsurface right below the channel surface. So think of it as shallow groundwater. Exchange between the water in the channel and that subsurface, which is what I was showing with the dotted arrow there, 
is very important in determining what's dissolved in the water because there are a lot of bacteria that live in that shallow subsurface area that are very good at removing nitrogen from water. So if you can have water going into the stream bed and coming back out, it's a natural cleaning mechanism. And the things that help ex increase that exchange or make the water go into the bed and come back out a little ways downstream are physical complexity. So riffles and pools, log jams, beaver dams. Some of these irregularities really promote that exchange with the shallow subsurface. Another degree of connectivity is between things moving down the channel and out across the valley bottom of the floodplain. If you can get some of the flow out of the channel during peak flow, some of the sediment goes with it, some of that organic matter, some of those nutrients, and some of the contaminants, you can store them, move them downstream more slowly, either during a flood or just during normal high flow. But you're also creating a lot of habitat for a variety of organisms that use floodplains, from fish to quite a variety of plants. And then, of course, there's connectivity upstream, downstream. And, and most of us think of downstream, water and sediment and other things moving downstream. But then there are all the organisms that go upstream for different parts of their life cycle. And salmon are by far the most famous, but there are others too. Um, eels, for example, or various species of insects. So the more physical complexity you have, the slower some of this downstream flux is, and conversely, the more feasible it may be to go upstream. Now, I'm sure you've all seen pictures at some point of salmon jumping up waterfalls. <laughs> There's, it's an interesting dichotomy. For a long time, fish biologists pulled log jams out of rivers uh, up until the 1970s in some cases because they thought they were impeding the passage of fish upstream. And I always wonder, well, what were they thinking the fish did for all of prehistory when there was all that wood? But, Anyway, they've stopped doing that now, and they really like log jams because, of course, the fish can jump over them. The log jams can limit some of the upstream movement, but mostly they're just slowing the downstream movement in ways that are beneficial. So in general, the degree of physical complexity determines how quickly and how readily things move up and downstream. And connectivity is very important in just how material of various types, water, sediment, nutrients, are distributed throughout a river network. So physical complexity influences that. Okay, so there's all these reasons to care about complexity. Everybody knows what metamorphosis is that change from one form to another. What I'm referring to here is that there has been a change in, I'm going to focus on the mountain rivers in Colorado, but I could easily focus on the rivers around us, even though I can't pronounce their names here in Ohio. Most rivers around the world, if you look at them, there's been a pretty dramatic change in their form and therefore in their function as a result of human activities. So it's, if I start with the mountain rivers in Colorado, one of the big differences has been these branching and rejoining channels that are associated with log jams and beaver dams. They're not very common in the networks, but where they occur, they create enor an enormous amount of complexity and a lot of storage. And they're, they're either, if they're present, they only occur in one of two scenarios. One is that you've got these very frequent uh, or high frequency of these channel spanning log jams as you go downstream. So there's lots of obstructions that force the flow out across the valley bottom. The other is that there are beaver that are building these dams and creating the same type of obstruction and forcing the flow out of the channel. So as long as you have one of these two obstructions, you're more likely to have that branching and rejoining if you have a wide enough valley bottom to permit that. So looking at this as just a simple model, Resist. If you have a tree that falls in the forest, whether anybody hears it or not, one thing that can happen, if it falls into a river, if there's a part of it that's above the active channel, say <laughs> up on the stream bank, it creates what's called a ramp. And it's very hard to move a ramp if it's got a big root wad anchored on the bank. So it's more likely to catch other wood and transport and form a log jam. And what happens next depends partly on what the valley looks like. If it's a very steep, narrow valley in the mountains, you have this log jam, and it's, it's a small effect. This is a fairly steep section. You can see the valley bottom is just barely wider than the channel. So you get this step down associated with the log jam. But the backwater only goes a short distance upstream, maybe one to two times the average channel width. And that log jam doesn't last very long. When you have snowmelt peak flows coming through, there's a lot of water that builds up behind that log jam. There's a lot of force exerted on it. The jam is likely to blow out. So they last less than a decade, and it's a very local effect. If you have exactly the same log jam forming in a wide, lower gradient or, or gentler downstream slope in the valley bottom, you get a very different scenario. So first of all, you get a longer backwater, 
uh, because it's at a lower gradient. So if you have the same obstacle, the backwater extends farther upstream. That forces the flow out of the channel bank, or it forces the channel to move from side to side across the valley. You get those channels that branch and rejoin, and avulsion just means the channel is moving back and forth across the valley bottom. As those motions are occurring, there's some stream bank that's being eroded, so you're bringing more wood into the channel, and you're creating bigger log jams. And now when you have a big flow come along, instead of just all building up behind the log jam, it can go over the channel banks and lose a lot of its energy going across the floodplain. The floodplain is like a safety release valve. So these jams last longer, and they have this greater effect. This gets back to what I was showing in one of the early slides. You can have these different sources of physical complexity, but their effects depend very much on the specific setting. So a log jam creates one level of complexity and change in channel process if it's in a wide, shallow <laughs> valley versus in a steep, narrow valley. And an example, uh, this is a, the biggest log jam I've ever seen in Colorado, although I, I think these were much more common historically. This is in Rocky Mountain National Park. This is one of my colleagues uh, at the upstream end of it, so basically here. A lot of wood here that was forcing flow out of the channel, creating this very complex network of branching and rejoining channels in association with that. Okay, that's great. But what's the metamorphosis? Well, if you take the beavers or the old growth forest that creates all that abundant wood in the stream out, the log jams and the beaver dams go away. And you go through this transition. So this is the photo you've seen before. The active beaver meadow, there's a very active beaver colony there. Many dams that they're building. This is a similar place. It's actually named, the proper name for it is Beaver Brook, or the official geographic name, and that's Upper Beaver Meadows. It's a place name on the park map for Rocky Mountain National Park. There's no beaver there. There were historically, and this system looked much more like this, but the beavers have abandoned the site for about 30 years now. So you've gone through that process of reverting to just one channel that's larger. It's cut down into the meadow. The whole meadow is dried out. And this photo is a little bit misleading. It was taken in June. It's still greener and a little bit moister than the uplands, but it's much drier than the active beaver meadow. So you go through this metamorphosis. When you remove these drivers of physical complexity, it really changes how the whole valley bottom functions in this case. And just a, another illustration of this, these are obviously aerial photos of Moraine Park. That was a place that I mentioned that burned after the 2012 fire. You can see in 1964, there's several channels that are sub-parallel across the valley bottom. That's when beavers were still there. By 1987, the beavers are disappearing. You, you can see the valley bottom's drier. And you're going to just a couple of channels. And if you go there today, there's one channel left. Uh, you've basically lost all those secondary channels. And this is what it looks like. And it's an absolutely beautiful place. It's one of the iconic views in Rocky Mountain National Park. You have this gorgeous view of the Continental Divide. But if you know the history of it, if you know that just a couple decades earlier, it looked very different. It had a lot more physical complexity, a lot more ability to slow the downstream passage of water, sediment, and nutrients, a lot more buffering against floods or droughts. Then you start to regard this landscape differently. So, Hopefully you're, you're seeing a little bit of a similarity to that drawing I showed you at the beginning of the river in England. There's no question it's beautiful, but how does it compare to what you might consider a natural condition, or in this case a very recent condition when the beavers are present? It's quite different in terms of complexity. So if you have those physical drivers or biotic drivers, old growth forest, log jams, and beavers who are happily building dams, you have all these secondary effects. You get the higher flows going out across the valley bottom. Some of that water soaks in, so you end up with a very wet environment. There's a lot of exchange between that surface flow and the shallow subsurface. That affects water chemistry. There's a variety of environments in those smaller secondary channels that support different insects and different fish and different plants. You're storing a lot of sediment and organic material across the valley bottom. You're storing nutrients, and you're creating this abundance of species and organisms, as well as physical habitats. So the river metamorphosis is that when you take those biotic drivers out, you take out the beavers or log jams in this case, you go to the simpler system, you lose physical complexity, and they become what I've referred to as leaky rivers, because instead of storing sediment and water and nutrients, it just goes downstream very quickly. And it's not a, a simple reversion. You, know, you take the beavers out, the meadow dries out, the channel cuts down, you've got this single thread thing. Can you just 
put the beavers back in and say, go to it. It's not quite that simple. That's part of the metamorphosis. So the evidence that messy equals healthy, and I'll just go through this briefly, some of our current research, we've been looking at how much organic carbon is stored in valley bottoms, and this is Nick Sutphin's PhD work. And one of the things that Nick has found, and this is a, a little bit of an intimidating looking graph, but on this axis, it's just the amount of carbon per unit area. So if you took a chunk of the valley bottom, how much organic carbon is stored in that sediment? And this is the above ground part. So the brown is how much is stored in dead wood on the ground. The green is living vegetation. And this is how much is stored in the floodplain sediment. Those first four bars are examples of these very physically complex channel segments where there's beaver dams or lots of log jams. There's a lot of carbon stored. If you look at these, there are areas where you have both a narrower and steeper valley bottom, but also lacking beaver dams and lots of log jams. <laughs> what we found is that those physically complex segments are only about a quarter of the total river network, but they store about three quarters of the carbon. So they're really disproportionately important. And the rivers are only a small proportion of the total landscape, but they're storing almost a quarter of the total carbon in the whole watershed. You might be thinking, well, why all the emphasis on carbon? Well, of course, as we try to understand the global carbon cycles in the context of climate change and changes in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, we want to know where the carbon is in the landscape, how it gets moved around, where it gets stored. Well, a fair amount of it is being stored in river networks, but the ability of rivers and their floodplains to store that carbon gets back to this physical complexity and how much they're slowing down fluxes in material going downstream. So second looking uh, line of evidence, we've looked at the carbon storage within the channels themselves, not just in the floodplains. And this is Natalie Beckman's PhD work, and Natalie is six feet tall. So that's a, a very large tree in old growth. And she was looking at what's in the active channel. So this is, again, the amount of carbon per, in this case, unit length of stream. Altered here refers to forests that have had some management history. There's been timber harvest, or the channels have been manipulated. <laughs> And natural is both old growth forest that's older than 200 years, but also younger forest that has not been managed. And there's a lot more carbon in those natural rivers in the form of log jams and the finer organic matter that's stored with the log jams. And also a smaller percentage of that total carbon is in the wood itself. And that's important because it's the small stuff, the pine needles and twigs and leaves that are more available to stream organisms, to microbes and bacteria and insects. So basically, these old growth or natural forests are creating more physical complexity that's storing a lot more carbon in the channel as well. So the wood is trapping the finer organic matter, and that is not a technical term, I just made that up, but the wood is sloughing off particles that are also you know, little bits of wood that are more biologically accessible to, again, the bacteria, microbes, and insects that really are the start um, of that stream food web. Another line of evidence, we're looking at, okay, you're storing carbon, what's it going into? What's happening to it? And uh, this is another PhD student, Bridget Livers, who's working on this. And this is a big group project where we're looking at uh, how carbon and nitrogen are taken up within streams. You have things coming in from the uplands. Do they just go zooming downstream or do they get stored along the stream network and used? We're looking at where those nutrients go if they're stored. And animal production here is stream insects, trout, and riparian spiders, which are one of the things that eat the stream insects when they emerge as adults. Think of things like caddisflies and mayflies. And then scaling that up to, so I meant to point to that, to the entire network scale. So what we're finding is that if you have old growth forests, you have big trees, they form big log jams and more log jams. So they're storing a lot of that fine organic matter and carbon, as Natalie showed. That's allowing anything moving down the channel, nitrogen, carbon, phosphorus, to be stored, at least temporarily, and to be exchanged with that hyperreic <laughs> zone. And that's producing a lot more animal tissue. We're not finding any more aquatic insects. They're being produced, but they're being gobbled up right away. We're finding a lot more fish. And I didn't go out to sample with them, but I, I imagine my colleagues, they call it spidering. They go out at night with headlamps and catch these riparian spiders. It must be a lot of fun. Uh, they're finding more spiders and fish. So the, the insects are being produced, but they're being eaten. So there's a lot more animal production and ecosystem productivity associated with this messiness. And the new one that we're just starting is looking at those beaver meadows. This is uh, an, an old abandoned beaver dam. You can see some of the gnawed wood sticking out of the base. These are all over these rivers in Rocky Mountain National Park. 
there are very few places where there's still active beaver colonies. So we're trying to understand, all right, what was the retention and productivity of these systems when all these dams were active and were occupied, and how has that changed as the beavers have disappeared? And just a very brief or, or uh, preliminary pilot study, there are these big beaver meadow complexes like the ones I've been showing you photos of. When they dry out, cumulatively, they're storing something like 8% of the total carbon in the entire landscape on the east side of Rocky Mountain National Park. When they were wet and they were active and the beavers were present, it was closer to 23%. So again, losing that physical complexity has pretty important implications for how nutrients and organic matter move through the landscape and through the river network. So to put all this in context, I've been focusing a lot on the Rocky Mountain National Park. Everything I've said could apply to rivers anywhere around the world. Uh, much of what we as humans do is reduce that physical complexity. If we look at old growth forest, for example, we've reduced forest cover uh, by about half globally. And there are very few places that still have old growth forests. And old growth forest is important because it means big trees, big diameter, tall. So if they fall in the stream, it's much harder for the stream to move them. They're more likely to catch the smaller material and transport and create these big log jams that are very good at producing complexity. Beavers, there's just a fraction of what there was historically prior to Europeans coming to this country and having a commercial fur trade. And if we just use Rocky Mountain National Park again, uh, you know, I've mentioned that there's these abandoned beaver dams all over the place. Historically, they were much more common. This place that's now called Upper Beaver Meadows but has no beavers, we used a technique called ground penetrating radar where you send radar waves into the ground and they're reflected by the underlying sediment so you can image the subsurface. And we were looking for the, what proportion of the sediment in some of these valleys was associated with old beaver dams and ponds. And it's about half of the sediment that has moved down these channels and been deposited since the glaciers retreated. So the beaver dams were pretty important when they were present in terms of storing sediment. So I've talked about this river metamorphosis. We remove the physical complexity and the function changes. Borrowing another idea from ecologists, they talk about alternative stable states. And if you can see my hands, it's like there's two cups. If you imagine a big ridge in between them. This is one way that an ecosystem can exist, say a river network, and this is another way. They're both equally stable. They can persist for long periods of time, but to get from one to the other, you have to overcome, you have to climb over the mountain, basically. There has to be some input of energy. So in terms of what I've been talking about, if we look at log jams, for example, you can have two alternates for a river. It can be wood rich, where there's lots of wood in there, and under natural conditions, the amount of wood coming in fluctuates through time. You have forest fires, you have tornadoes up here, um, different things that cause the forest to put a lot of trees in the uh, streams or not. But the, the most natural rivers in forest environments never go to no wood, at least in the temperate zone. There's always some wood that's stored in there. The, the volume fluctuates through time. If you take all the wood out, and we have done that throughout the US for navigation, for flood control, for different reasons, then even if you leave it alone, like there's a tree there about to fall into that channel, that tree's probably going to keep going. It's like you getting on I-71, I don't know, at 3 in the morning on Sunday. There's no other cars in your way. You can just go. <laughs> Most of the time, like I came up from Columbus today, and we were in bumper traffic, stop and go traffic. So if there's other wood in the channel, it's like cars in a, a traffic jam. Any new wood that comes in isn't going to move very far. But once you pull all the wood out, it's very hard to go back to this wood-rich state. You're more likely to stay in a wood-poor state. If it's beaver dams, as long as the beavers are there, they keep building dams. They keep that water table high, keep a very wet valley bottom. If the beavers go away for whatever reason, whether it's trapping or something else, you concentrate the water in a single channel, it's more likely to cut down and drain that whole meadow and you go to something that ecologists call an elk grassland and that's a very stable, persistent state. You could drop off a pair of happily mated beavers and say, oh, go to it, damn it. There's nothing for them to eat. Sorry, that was a bad pun, but um, they can't make dams. There's no woody material and there's no woody material because the shrubs like willows need a very wet valley bottom. So they're not going to grow in that environment. So you've now moved into a different configuration that can persist on its own unless something shifts it back. And that something, in, in a case like this, would probably be people coming in and creating artificial beaver dams, which is now a river restoration technique, to raise the water level, allow the willows to grow back until the beavers can come in. And I imagine them saying, oh, when they look at our dams, messy, and then starting over and building good ones. But again, the point is, 
it's not easy to move back and forth. If you remove all the physical complexity, it can be difficult to reintroduce, and you lose a lot of the function that goes with that. So, uh, bad pun on dumb and dumber. Uh, there's different levels of messiness or physical complexity. It partly depends on that geomorphic context. Are you up in the mountains? Are you in the headwaters, the lowlands, big river, small river? Partly depends on the natural disturbance around here. You've got floods, you've got tornadoes, you've certainly got droughts. Uh, what's the biome? Is it a forest, temperate, tropical, is it a grassland? And it definitely depends on what the land use history is. You know, maybe there were a much higher density of beavers historically, but we're probably not going to go back to that. So what's a realistic level of complexity to try and strive for? And just three rivers from very different areas, Sardinia, Borneo, Colorado, you have different sources of physical complexity and different levels that are appropriate or feasible based on where you are in the world and what the history of land use is. So again, one of these, it's graphs that has a lot of things on it, but this is just going from very small scale, something less than a meter, to say hundreds of, uh, or hundreds of thousands of kilometers, instantaneous to geological time. You know, I talked about those different sources of complexity, so differences in the, the shape of the bed, the cross-section, the banks, the plan form. You can look at complexity or, or messiness at different scales. And at this sort of long time, large space scale, it's things like climate and the geologic regime that shape that. But much of what we do is operating at these intermediate time and space scales through history of our river engineering and land use. And the net effect of what we've done is to make rivers simpler and less complex. We channelize them, we block off the overbank areas with levees, we regulate the flow with dams and diversions, we dredge them to make them more navigable or to increase uh, the ability of floodwaters to stay in them, so for flood control. So we really dramatically reduce the physical complexity. So going back to these images that we started with, you know, again, if you look at this river now, with all the things I've been talking about, it's nice, it's attractive, it's like the river in Moraine Park, but for England in particular, where this is supposed to be, it's not really a very physically complex river or a completely natural river, and it's lost a lot of function. Without question, it's much better than that alternative. And it's, this isn't an either or, where you know it's a drainage canal or it's a completely, extremely complex river. There's lots of nuances or intermediate stages where you can restore some of the physical complexity and some of the function. But what, one of the things that I hope people can start to do is look at something like this, and this is a natural river in Rocky Mountain National Park in the backcountry in old growth forest and not immediately saying, oh, it's a mess. We need to clean it up. We need to improve it. We need to get all the complexity out. Part of it is training ourselves to think about rivers as ecosystems that may not meet our aesthetic expectations uh, based on our experience with much more altered and urbanized rivers. But these rivers that look so messy and that are very difficult to move around in and work in are actually very functional and very healthy. So thank you very much. Excellent. Th thank you so very much. I um, want to take a chance now to uh, open questions to the floor. Um, you mentioned one of the ways you can restore some of these rivers is to make artificial beaver dams. Um, what are some other ways to do that? It seems kind of like a big job, so. Well, there's a, um, I was thinking specifically of the, I can't tell, he, yeah, it's on again, right, you can hear me, okay. Uh, the work of one of my colleagues at Utah State University, Joe Wheaton, and what they're doing is mapping habitat suitability, so what would be a good place for beavers, and then they, they literally put physical obstacles into the channel. Usually it's like almost um, like driving piers into the channel, logs that they put in vertically, and they, they make a, temporary beaver dam and the idea is that they can pond up water and start to promote some of that channel floodplain connectivity and create the wet valley bottoms. But in general, there's now something called engineered log jams that were introduced first in the Pacific Northwest. So you can put wood back in channels. Uh, when you're doing channel restoration, uh, until very recently people would go in and, and create a pretty uniform channel, so consistent width, depth, and it was uh, either straight or they would create this very perfect meandering form like a sign generated mathematical function. If you just put a few irregularities in there, you put some big boulders, 
uh, you create some embayments in the bank, or the most effective way is to not so rigidly engineer the channel that it can adjust. So the next time there's even a moderate flood, instead of having these banks that are completely stabilized, you would allow the, the higher water to move some of that sediment around and start to create complexity. And of course it depends on the context in which you're doing this. If you're doing it in the middle of the town of Delaware, the city of Delaware, you've probably got a narrow zone to work with. You're not going to be able to have a huge floodplain. But the more you can allow the river to adjust in response to changing inputs of water and sediment, the more physically complex it's going to be. Until very, very recently, most of what we did was to create something that was like an engineer's uh, perfect plan. And it would just be very straight, uniform trapezoid. We're gradually moving away from that. There's a program in river called, a, or a program in Europe called Room for Rivers. Now historically they might have had a floodplain like this and they went to something that's just the channel and the whole valley bottom is farmed. Now they're moving the levees back a little bit. So they're not going back to the historic width, but even restoring some of that width can restore a lot of function. In the U.S. there's something called a string of beads approach that they're using on the upper Missouri or the Illinois or the upper Mississippi. Those rivers are extremely channelized. They're highly regulated for navigation, for barge traffic. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of literally millions of people and probably hundreds of millions of dollars of commerce and agriculture in those valley bottoms who can't go back easily to the historic configuration. But the beads are places like national wildlife refuges where they can reconnect the river at least on that local scale. So this, it's a string of beads because there's this sort of straight, simple, narrow channel in between, but then there'll be a bead where they restore some of that complexity and function. So you can introduce complexity, you can engineer it in, but usually the most effective is if you can just give the river a little bit of room and allow it some adjustment. It will create its own complexity and then of course it sustains itself too. Again, it, yeah, that may not be feasible in an urban environment. Although, I don't know about this part of the world, but where I'm from, kayaking parks are really becoming a big tourist thing and they'll put them in the middle of an urban area. So there's some complexity that's built into those. It's usually uh, cemented or riprapped in place, but <laughs> It's not just a straight, uniform channel. OK, I got one for you. So uh, given all the complexity and that now retains the water in the watershed, is this a cost-effective way of dealing with the drought that's ongoing in the western United States? Yes, that is a great question. Uh, my bias, of course, is to say absolutely. But there's very little evidence for that. I, Two weeks ago, I had somebody from the Forest Service saying, can you quantify some of the ecosystem services associated with beaver meadows? And I said, yes, and we will. So we're, we're actively working on that. Uh, people have looked at ecosystem services. Of course, that, that's the idea that the functions that natural rivers provide, flood control, clean water, recreation, whether it be hunting, fishing, paddling, etc. You can put a dollar value on those. It's, it's difficult to do because a lot of times it's based on surveys and somebody will come up to you and say, how much is flood control worth to you? How much more would you be willing to pay in your utility bill? And what they say in the survey versus what they're actually willing to pay can differ. It's a hard thing to quantify, but um, the studies that have been done almost always show that having a function, not almost always, all the ones I've ever seen do show, having a functional river corridor is very cost effective. You save a lot more money than you spend in say, removing that land from agricultural production, for example. I have a, a related question to that. I think I, I read a paper back in 2008 that was talking about uh, human effects on the hydrologic cycle. And they were talking a lot about some of these, these things you've discussed, channelizing rivers, uh, paving that increases the speed of runoff instead of having it percolate into groundwater it will go into river channels and they were talking of the the paper was trying to assess whether overall we were kind of rushing water back to the sea or whether we were actually retaining it with dams do you have any more updated sense of the overall effect yes both <laughs> so we're in urban areas uh, and actually agricultural areas because of it goes into the channels much more quickly, but then it gets stored in reservoirs. Uh, there was a nice paper that was the, I think it was the aging of continental runoff. It gets stored much for much longer periods of time than it did historically. And uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but humans now move more sediment than any natural process. We out, we outrank rivers, glaciers, wind, uh, tsunamis, whatever else, all lumped together. 
So cumulatively, our effects with urbanization, agriculture, transportation corridors, et cetera, we move more sediment than anything else. But we've also dramatically decreased the amount of sediment going to the global oceans because of what's being stored in reservoirs. So we're mobilizing more from the land into the river networks, but then we're trapping it in the river networks. So, yeah, uh, cumulatively, we, we are, I don't want to say we rule, but we kind of do in terms of river process. Uh, so, do you have an idea of like what was the time scale of when naturally beavers would abandon a valley? Would that system, I mean, how would it would would it would it eventually go back and they, the beavers would go, come back on their own, like way back then, or would the system blow out and then eventually that sediment would come would move downstream and then the beavers would come back and then and what was the time scale of that? Can I interject? Sure. That, that's actually connected to one of the things I was wondering in terms of, I'm probably too close to the speaker now, um, time scale in beavers and natural migrations of beavers, how much did we mess with that with the fur trade? Enormously. That's the one word answer, but I, yeah, I was kind of, I set you up by telling you there were no more, almost no more beavers in Rocky Mountain. I was waiting to see if somebody would ask me why. Um, in Rocky Mountain, as far as we can tell, these meadows have been occupied since the glaciers retreated continuously. So we've got radiocarbon dates that go back about 9,000 years, and it's just been continuous occupation. They don't go away, as long as the river's big enough. There's been work in Yellowstone that shows on the smaller rivers when you go through periods of drier climate, the beavers leave. They go lower down the river network where there's constant river flow. The reason there's no river or no beavers in Rocky Mountain National Park, there, there may be multiple explanations, but a big one is elk. Have any of you ever been to Rocky Mountain National Park? And did you see elk? They're, they're definitely the charismatic <laughs> megafauna for that park. There's a lot of elk. The elk were hunted to extinction in that region, but they decided you know, they, they were native to the region, they, so they reintroduced them from Yellowstone, and the elk have been very happy because. When the elk were hunted to extinction, all their predators were also hunted to extinction. This was about the 1920s. So we used to have wolves, grizzly bears, some of the other big carnivores in the park, and they're gone, and they haven't been reintroduced. So we have lots and lots of elk. And elk are a little bit like domestic cattle. They like water areas. So if nobody keeps them moving, like uh, primarily a wolf pack, they spend a lot of time along the rivers, and they're now at unnaturally high numbers because they're also smart enough to figure out that if they go outside the park boundaries, they can be shot. It's surrounded by national forest where hunting is allowed. So the park has been undertaking various elk population control strategies for several decades now. They had controlled shoots at night for a while. That's not very popular with the public. So if you go to the park now and you see the elk that look like they're wearing the orthopedic collars and they've got neck problems, those are contraceptive devices. They're trying that way of limiting the herds. But this comes into beavers because the elk eat the willows and the aspen and some of the woody riparian plants that beavers like. And the elk will eat them down to the ground and they'll keep doing that. So the plants either die off or there's just no above ground portion. If you go to the park and you go to some of the valley bottoms, you'll see these big fences. And there's a forest inside and there's grasses out, outside. Those are elk exclusion, grazing exclosures. And they're, they're experiments to see what happens when they keep the elk out. So if you look at elk and beaver population numbers plotted against one another, it's like this. The elk go up through time, the beaver go down through time. And in about 1980, the beaver populations fell off a cliff, and they, they have, they're mostly gone from the park now. So when the beavers disappear, that reversion to a dry grassland occurs within a decade. How quickly the sediment moves downstream, I'm not sure yet. That's something that we're just starting to look at using radiocarbon dates. If the willows are still there, the beaver can come back really quickly within a couple of years. But the issue is that the water tables drop so there are no food or building materials for the beaver. And that's part of the, there's a long-term restoration strategy in the park with those grazing exposures to bring back the woody vegetation and eventually reintroduce the beavers. Elsewhere in the country it was trapping, of course, that removed a lot of the beavers and now we keep them out. We keep trapping them, not so much for the furs, but because they're considered a nuisance species. You know, they, uh, 
create overbank flooding that drowns out roads or destroys property or just creates a ponded area where people want a flowing stream. Or they build dams and the dams are not like our big concrete dams. They fail a lot of times at high flow and a lot of that material goes downstream. The beavers just rebuild it. But if there's an uh, irrigation structure downstream or a culvert, people get very upset at all this smaller wood clogging it up. So they're, they're removed often for aesthetic or nuisance purposes. And that's one of the things that's limiting beaver population. Beavers, it turns out, are, are pretty adaptive to urban areas. There are a lot of videos online, some really interesting ones actually on YouTube, uh, where they're living in, you know, in the middle of a, a city like Delaware, and they could be living on this river. I, I don't know if they are, but they, they don't seem to mind us so much. It's the other way around. We don't like them a lot of times. All right, well, I think we should thank um, Ellen for joining us again and feel.